Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, and I'm from DeepAstronomy.com. And we are, I'm so excited about today because what I have for you today is an update on the LISA mission uh, status, I guess. We'll get a status on what's going on with the laser interferometer space antenna. And that is a, that is a mission that is uh, being designed and built and planned for right now for launch in the mid 2030s. And we, uh, if you know anything about gravitational waves, and if you don't, that's okay too, because I'll, we'll, we'll learn about those here. We are going to be, uh, this is going to be an exciting hangout because these guys are going to be looking at uh, all kinds of really cool gravitational wave events. This is a brand new area of astronomy that is, um, that it's, it's just exploding right now. This didn't exist just well, I guess the first gravitational wave detection was back in 2016. So that is how young this field of astronomy is. And so the the, the laser, the LISA project is headed by the by a consortium uh, that is, I think, led by the European Space Agency. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. NASA is also involved, and uh, we the it's a it's a large group of people that are working on getting this thing up and launched. And we're going to talk about what it is and what it's going to do here in just a minute. But before I do, I have to let you guys know that I am streaming on YouTube as well as uh, Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, and I think that's it. Uh, so uh, and so, if you want to ask us questions, I'm looking at all the chats. So I hope you will uh, interact with our guests here uh, today. This is an anniversary of uh, the launch of the Lisa Pathfinder. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. But if you guys are longtime viewers of Deep Astronomy know that we did a hangout with the with the Lisa Pathfinder guys way back and uh, way back at when they first had the first results of the mission itself, which was a test flight of the technology that they're going to use in Lisa. So we'll learn all about that now. Um, so let, let me just go ahead and bring up my my panel. With me today is um, Martin Hendry. He is from the University of Glasgow. Also with me is um, uh, Charles, uh, Charles DeLang. He's from the University of Geneva. Welcome, Charles. Uh, Thomas Kupfer is from the um, is from Texas Tech University, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. And Jessica's here. Let me put her up. There she is. Jessica Page uh, is also with us. She's from the University of Alabama at Huntsville. Can you hear me, Jessica? I can. Good. Uh, we, we didn't get a chance to do a, a sound check, so I'm just glad. I'm glad we're here. Okay. So, Martin, let me start with you. Let's give us give us an update. Oh, I'm sorry. I also want to mention one more one more thing. I am monitoring the chat also on our Deep Astronomy. Discord a server as well. The link to that is in the description box. I would invite you guys to follow the Lisa Consortium. Also, the links to those are in the description box of this video as well. So I hope you will um, take advantage of that. Okay, Martin, welcome. Martin Henry. Hi, how are you doing, Tony? And welcome to um, everyone who's listening in online. And we're looking forward to interacting with you over the next hour or so. So I'm going to kick things off with just a little bit of context as to why we're here. And um, I guess uh, part of that story is about some very specific anniversaries. So we're celebrating one that relates to 2015, but we're also in some sense going all the way back to 1915. And so um, I should just check if you can see my screen. All right, uh, let, me, uh, let me turn Before it on. Before I go any further, you should be seeing Einstein right now, but maybe um, I need to just restart yes, steering. Can, I, I could see why we can see Einstein, but uh, he, you might want to uh, do the start the slideshow part of it. There you go. Uh, exactly. Now so up. now you should be there seeing Einstein go. maximize the full screen. And that's, uh, that's yep. a sign that we're ready to go. So, um, <laughs> right. yeah. So like I was saying, if we take ourselves back to 1915, then on November 25th of that year is when Einstein published his general theory of relativity, his theory of gravity. And that has become part and parcel of how we understand gravity in our modern 21st century. It informs all sorts of aspects of our everyday lives, not just the exotic stuff that's out there in the cosmos, but things like the rate at which time flows in the GPS satellites that connect to your smartphone. So without correcting for that different rate of time flowing, then your GPS smartphone would t send you to the wrong place. And, and that's a sign of how important even those tiny corrections in general relativity are for our everyday life. What is the impact of general relativity on the cosmic scale, on the scale of violence like 
colliding black holes or exploding stars. And how general relativity plays out there is in the context of the picture that we have of Einstein's theory, that gravity is a, a, a manifestation of space-time curvature. So there's a neat phrase attributed to John Wheeler, which kind of sums this up. He said that space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. So that's your general relativity 101, you know, just one sentence to sum it all up. So we think of, you know, space-time like a stretched sheet of rubber, like a trampoline. It's an imperfect analogy, but it gives us some sense, some way to visualize what the effect of a massive body might be. It causes a curving of them, just like the Earth on my diagram here. But gravitational waves, they come in when that space-time curvature is changing. And for that, you really need much more massive and compact objects than just a plain old planet like the Earth. And there, we're looking to the cosmos to be our laboratory in extreme events like those black holes colliding that I mentioned. And the technology that we use to detect a phenomenon like that is based on the interference of laser beams. And that was what underpinned the first detection of gravitational waves that Tony referred to. That was announced in February 2016, but it actually occurred in September 2015. It took the LIGO and Virgo collaborations many months to be absolutely sure that we had indeed detected the merger of two black holes more than a billion light years away. So I'm part of the LIGO collaboration as well. So that was a very busy time for me. While I was doing all of that, my colleagues, as we released the results just a few months later of these black holes merging, my colleagues within the LISA collaboration, we were all getting excited about that as well. And as um, Tony mentioned, this is a long time scale endeavor. It's um, a project that really began in um, its you know, very most um, simple um, imagined form back in the 1970s, where you know, we could dream back then that uh, we could put a gravitational wave detector into space. And um, well, it's taken a long time to get even to the stage we're at. And there's no doubt that the detection of gravitational waves from ground-based interferometers like LIGO and Virgo has really helped to move that story along. So this is um, the waveforms of the very first black hole merger that we saw back in 2015. And just a few weeks ago, LIGO and Virgo released our latest catalog of gravitational wave events. So there's now 50 confirmed detections of black holes and neutron stars. So those are a few tens to up to just over a hundred times the mass of our sun. But when it comes to LISA, we're looking to probe a different regime altogether. And that's where our story this evening is going to take us, because just like there's a spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, there's a spectrum of gravitational wave radiation. And the ground-based detectors like LIGO and Virgo are focused on high frequency gravitational waves, whereas LISA is going to open up a window at much lower frequencies, frequencies of um, about um, millihertz, um, so uh, hundreds to thousands of a hertz, and that means gravitational waves with a period of somewhere in the region of minutes to hours. In fact, there's another part of the spectrum which is really interesting too, which is all about detecting gravitational waves using pulsars as probes of those gravitational waves. And if there's time, we can chat a bit about that as well, but we're mainly going to focus on LISA, because that's where our other anniversary comes in. Because five years ago today, the LISA Pathfinder satellite was launched. So here's an artist's impression of it, sailing on its way out to its orbit. And it was launched from an Ariane launcher in French Guiana on December 3rd, 2015. And its mission was not to detect gravitational waves, but to prove that the technology that LISA would need to detect gravitational waves out there in space was viable. And that means, could we control and measure the positions of the spacecraft accurately enough to detect those tiny changes in position brought about by the passage of a gravitational wave? And within a couple of years, Lisa Pathfinder had published its results and they were really astounding. 
you know, they far exceeded expectations. So this is a complicated looking graph. We don't have, you know, well, we have lots of those in astronomy um, to deal with, but we're not going to get too bogged down in them this evening. But the main thing to take away from this is that these numbers are really small and they're a measure of the sensitivity of the detector. The way I like to see it in terms of the LIGO detectors is that we're measuring changes in the curvature of space time that are equivalent to about a million millions the width of a human hair. And even though LISA is on a much bigger scale because the satellites will be millions of kilometers apart, the sensitivity required is going to be comparable to that in order to detect gravitational waves, not from stellar mass black holes, but from more massive objects like supermassive black holes. And what this graph also lets us see is that these astoundingly small numbers are being achieved by LISA Pathfinder. So all these um, strange looking um, uh, squiggles as a function of frequency are banging the, the window that we want LISA to be sensitive in. And the LISA Pathfinder requirements were not really designed to go the whole way to that sensitivity, but it was built so well that in fact it did achieve that LISA requirement. So in fact, it exceeded it. So that's um, teed things up beautifully for this LISA mission, which is going to be the first gravitational wave observatory in space. And as we heard before, it's on schedule to be launched in the mid 2030s, 2034 to be precise. And a key step towards that was the official adoption by the European Space Agency of LISA as its um, L3 mission. So that's the third big mission that's coming up over the next couple of decades. So that adoption happened in 2017. And prior to that, the scientists involved had to submit a very detailed case to the European Space Agency, which you see um, the front page of on the left here. And one of the key diagrams from that is looking at the range out to which LISA will observe these supermassive black hole mergers. And the range is astounding. So if we measure it in redshift, which is one way of measuring how far back in time you're looking, then we're going to see LISA really far beyond the current limit of our galaxy surveys. And we're going to be seeing the, the most distant um, sources that LISA will see will be at a time really before galaxy formation had hardly got going. So in some sense, that means we're going to be looking at things that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And to realize all that science needs a very large group of scientists to make that all happen. And that's what we call the LISA Consortium. So we're all members of that. And we're very pleased to be sharing with you um, for this session some of the scientific goals of LISA and how we're going to get there over the next 14 or 15 years. So that's all I had just to kind of set things up. And I'm now going to um, introduce uh, the panel. We'll invite them to just maybe say a little bit about themselves and what they work on. Um, I am in Glasgow uh, University. I mainly work on cosmology and multi-messenger astronomy. So that means combining gravitational wave observations with um, electromagnetic observations. That's going to be important for Lisa too. And um, let's maybe go to Jessica first. Um, you want to say hi, Jessica? Sure, yes. Hi, so yes, I'm Jessica Page. Um, so I work mainly on something called time delay interferometry, or TDI for short. And so this is the process of removing the loudest source of noise that we're going to have to deal with in the data. So uh, this noise is called the laser frequency noise, and it's going to come in at about seven orders of magnitude greater than the gravitational wave signals themselves. So we definitely have to deal with them. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jessica, you just said your noise is going to be seven orders of magnitude greater than your signal? <laughs> one, of the, oh, wow. one of the sources of noises, yes. Yes, wow, so we amazing. definitely have to, um, to remove it. And um, so the process of doing that is called time delay interferometry. Basically, you combine the same data streams and you delay some of them and add them together and the laser frequency noise ends up canceling out. Um, my approach to this is um, using data analysis techniques. So um, yeah, starting with the raw data and then estimating the parameters that you need to um, uh, for TDI to cancel out the noises. 
And so, yeah, I'd say that would probably be my specialty here is more um, data analysis, but I can also probably answer some questions on um, the science goals and um, some of the sources. Great stuff. Okay. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, and I'm, I'm speaking um, from my Glasgow perspective, uh, TDI is something we've worked on as well, and we've always been fascinated by uh, some of the ways in which Bayesian inference techniques have blown up all over astronomy, you know, they've become so commonly used, have great applications there as well. So excellent. Uh, Charles, now, do you want to say hi? Yep, sure. Hi. Uh, so my name is uh, Charles Delong. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Geneva. I'm um, actually in my third year. Um, so my research focuses on the uh, on the intersection between gravitational wave physics and, and cosmology. And I really want to learn everything that there is to learn about the propagation of gravitational waves in curved spacetime. Uh, so there are many things, there's lensing effects, uh, because the trajectory of the gravitational wave is not necessarily in a straight line in the universe. Um, there may be extra polarizations due to the fact that gravity may not be so well described by general relativity. Um, and um, yeah, many more things. I also have other interest in cosmology, so. Uh, cool. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and finally to Thomas. Yeah, hello uh, everyone. Um, my name is Thomas Kupfer. Um, I'm at Texas Tech University, so located in uh, West Texas. Um, so I think a lot about objects which we call white dwarfs. So these are actually um, only the most massive stars and as black holes. Stars like the sun will actually end up as a white wall. And Lisa will see thousands and thousands of them. And one of the cool things is that these white wolves also shine in the electromagnetic wave band. So you can observe them basically with your eye on your own telescopes. So they provide a really cool opportunity to observe them in, in both with gravitational waves and with electromagnetic waves. And that's something I do think a lot about how we can combine them, combine that in the most efficient and best way. Excellent. Uh, so that, that's given you um, some insight into not just our geographical spread, but also our, our, our range of scientific interests. Um, so, yeah, so we're um, all ears now and we'll be guided by Tony and we'll all pitch in and try to answer whatever questions you have for us. OK, great. There's a lot I want to talk about. So um, as far as Charles uh, sound, he's, he apologizes for being low, but there's, he's maxed out. Um, and I have zero control over people's volume levels. So I'm sorry about that. But Charles, maybe shout if uh, <laughs> if uh, you go, if, that's about all I can recommend at this point, because um, I don't get a, I don't get a chance to uh, adjust uh, sound levels. So there's a so there's a lot to unpack here. And I guess what I want to start with <laughs> is um, you guys that you'd already opened up, Martin, talking about what gravitational waves are. One of the things that confused me and I'll help I'd like for anyone on this panel to uh, helps help me understand this better but LIGO when it looks at gravitational wave events which are basically anything that happens that can warble space-time that's a scientific term warble absolutely <laughs> uh, so anything that can that can dis displace the trampoline uh, is something that it, that is a gravitational wave event. And, it, and generally it takes a lot of mass to make something warble. So uh, we look at things like black holes merging. We've seen a couple of neutron stars merging with LIGO as well. Yeah. Why is LIGO limited to seeing the size of black hole events, or actually I should say gravitational wave events that it has, that it does see? It doesn't see, for example, supermassive black holes uh, colliding. Yeah. But it does see these stellar mass or these 30 or 40 mass solar mass black holes uh, uh, merging as well as neutron stars. How come that's where it can see? Yeah. Shall I take this one, guys, since it's a LIGO one? Um, so basically, it's all to do with the mass of the object. There's a relationship between the frequency at which those um, objects will typically merge and their mass. So the more massive the black hole is, the lower the frequency at which the merger will occur. So basically, for the supermassive black holes, the frequency at which you expect them to get really close together and to merge is already well outside the range we can detect from the ground. So that means that they're inaccessible, at least the merger part, to ground-based detectors. And that's why you've got to put a detector in space if you want to see those 
lower frequency mergers because they're more massive. Now, the LIGO so the, detectors the can real see big ones a merger. Then, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm the sorry, real big ahead. ones then are lower frequency outside right. of the range of LIGO. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Now, when they're further apart, they're even lower frequency still, which is where that pulsar timing bit of the spectrum comes in. We probably don't have time to talk too much about that, but that's a whole fascinating area as well. That's when you're going to like billions of a hertz. But that's those supermassive black holes when they're probably a lot further apart and, and not radiating so strongly. But if you've got sensitive enough detectors, you can even pick that up from the effect it has on the pulsars. As soon as you start to move to higher frequencies, then you're in the regime where interferometry is the best way to go after it, either in space for the supermassive black holes or for the less massive ones, you can do it on the ground. Okay. So uh, is that, is it, big, what, what about being on the ground is a limiting factor? Why do we need something in space? Is it the noise level is greater uh, on the surface of the earth or what? why can't we see the the lower frequency uh, gravitational wave events on with using the ground Lido. just shakes too much that's fundamentally okay. the problem or warble and the ground warbles too much I the ground too much. <laughs> and, and jessica there's no is that is that like even more orders of magnitude higher <laughs> than the <laughs> signal on the ground <laughs> or is that a different level of noise yes yeah the effects yeah. of the earth um the noise is higher at the lower frequencies once you get past one hertz the noise the noises from the earth are just too high Okay, so we so this is all to set up the fact that we need Lisa, right? Because LIGO's great, and I mean, in fact, it was it had been in operation. How how long had LIGO been in operation before it even detected the first event in 2016? Well, it had been in operation as initial LIGO along with Virgo, and actually Geo 600, a small detector in Germany, for a number of years through the 2000s. But the plan was always that it would be upgraded around 2010, and that took five years. So if your question is really how long it had been creating the enhanced capabilities, it was just a couple of days before we made that first detection. Okay, all right, so that's right, because, uh, well, I, I say that because a friend of mine who worked with me in the Dark Energy Survey worked at the LIGO collaboration for many years before yeah. uh, they had detected anything. This would have been 2006 or seven. And uh, and uh, they had not yet detected anything, and then of course, as you point out, they redid it, uh, and yep. then detections detections started following. Uh, Kiara, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. I uh, just popped you in the hangout. Um, uh, Kiara's from uh, you're from Paris, correct? Hi. Uh, yes. Okay, so I, uh, Martin I... went through everybody and uh, introduced uh, what who they are and what they're doing. Why don't you give us a little introduction to what who you are and what you're doing? Uh, yes, so uh, hello everybody. My name is Chiara Caprini. Uh, I work in an institute uh, in Paris at the University of uh, Paris. And uh, my interest uh, is um, also focused on cosmology, but um, with a somewhat a different focus than the one of Charles. Uh, I'm studying the gravitational wave signals that come from the very early universe, so the very initial phases of uh, the evolution of, uh, of the universe. Um, and uh, Lisa actually is able to, uh, is in the right frequency band to pick up a very special signal uh, that might be uh, present and might arise from the very early epoch of our, of our universe. And uh, so that is why I am uh, uh, part of the Lisa Consortium. Um, because it fits well with my research interest. Yeah, uh, so w this is twice now I've heard about the early universe. So tell us a little bit about uh, how gravitational waves travel through the universe as compared to say normal electro, I say normal, as opposed to <laughs> electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> how, how, how do, uh, what is the difference between how a gravitational wave propagates? In other words, I, I guess my question is, do you have to wait billions of years to see gravitational wave events in the early universe uh, like you do for light waves traveling from far away? Yes, yeah, so uh, actually even more so <laughs> because um, <laughs> they, go they actually, the gravitational waves, they, they, um, uh, the way the gravitational wave interact, they interact uh, even weaker than, uh, much weaker actually than uh, electromagnetic waves. 
So there is a, a very special epoch in the evolution of the, of the universe, uh, which is uh, called uh, um, recombination, is where uh, the cosmic microwave background, which is, let's say, the eek of the uh, Big Bang, has been generated. Uh, this epoch uh, marks uh, a transition. So for uh, um, times that uh, arise uh, that are earlier than this epoch, the universe is opaque to photons, to electromagnetic radiation, which means that we cannot see there. It's like being in the fog. So after this epoch, the, the photons are free to propagate. And that is why we have now, if we look at the sky, we see the stars, we see the electromagnetic uh, um, emission from the stars, from the galaxies. And if we look with the telescopes, we see, uh, for example, the radio uh, emission, uh, the infrared and so on. And we can go further and further in the past, the, the far and, uh, we look at. Uh, in there, but there is a limit to that, and this limit is the generation, the epoch at which uh, the universe becomes opaque to electromagnetic radiation. Now, the great point about gravitational waves it, uh, is that the universe doesn't get opaque to gravitational waves ever. Actually, it does get opaque to gravitational waves at when it reaches the Planck time which is uh, some sort of <laughs> limit time in our knowledge. That's like 10 to the minus 34 or something seconds, isn't it? Exactly. It's, it's really and so hard. therefore, the importance of gravitational waves for cosmology, for early universe cosmology, is exactly that it provides us with a messenger of the extremely early epochs of our universe, in the universe evolution, uh, that we cannot reach using electromagnetic radiation. Man, that is that is really exciting. So, the 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 great the great brick wall of the universe has always been the the cosmic microwave background. We could never get to behind that veil because of what you say it was the universe was opaque. So, the, uh, but you're saying gravitational waves they don't care about that. They can go back uh, to times before the uh, recombination when the universe had cooled enough that photons could escape. You could go back and look in there yeah. using gravitational waves. What, what kind of information can you get from this period in the universe, from just looking at warbles in space-time? Yes. So um, first, first, I would like to uh, say, say something more about electromagnetic radiation, because okay. um, the cosmic background gives us actually access to uh, a very Uh oh, did she just freeze up for everybody? Yeah, uh -oh. sadly. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Yeah, her looks oh, like her internet. Just getting like interesting. Oh, oh no, you're back. Good. Your 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 internet just kicked out. There, Kiana. Okay. Okay. Am I back now? You're back. You're you back seem there. to be. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So so you were you said you you you're talking a little bit more about electromagnetic radiation. Uh, yes, about the cosmic out. background. Yeah. So because mm -hmm. uh, um, the we it is believed now uh, following the. Um, um, the standard picture of, uh, of the Big Bang theory, uh, it is believed that the universe started with a phase which is called inflation. Now, looking in the cosmic and microwave background, and in particular in the temperature fluctuation of this uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation, we have access. We sort of can probe this very peculiar epoch in the, in the evolution of the universe. Now, gravitational waves, instead, they all they obviously can also uh, bring us some information about inflation, about this very peculiar epoch. But furthermore, they can bring us information about other kind of processes that have uh, occurred in the early universe at, at um, temperatures a bit smaller than uh, the one of inflation. And for example, uh, they could be a probe of the presence of phase transitions in the early universe. You see, um, uh, phase transition is like when you put uh, water to boiling, for example, you provide heat to liquid water and it turns into vapor, uh, or when you freeze the water, it goes through a phase transition. So 
there is a system that changes its state. Now, it is believed that the universe also has changed its state during its evolution because it is a thermal state. There is a temperature, medium temperature in the universe, and therefore as the universe expands, the temperature drops, and it might have undergone several phase transitions. And some of these might produce a gravitational wave background uh, that Lisa might be able to pick up. <laughs> wow, another another background, okay. Wow. Okay. So there's a lot. Okay. There's a lot to digest there, but I, I think I want to get uh, Thomas in on this. Thomas, you're the one that said uh, that you have it. You're interested in the intersection between gravitational waves and cosmology, right? No, that was, Are that you, was, Charles, oh, I uh, that was Charles. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, you're the white dwarf. You were white dwarfs, right? You were interested in yeah, white dwarfs. So, so, the, okay. so maybe if I just maybe quickly add to what Kiara said about electromagnetic you certainly can. waves versus gravitational waves. So that's also true if you just look in our own galaxy. So if you look up, uh, look at the stars in the sky, almost all the stars we see are actually pretty much close by, basically in our own neighborhood. So we are not able to see stars on the other side of our own galaxy because there's just too much dust in the way. So a lot of the, the electromagnetic waves are just absorbed. So we're not able to see stars. What's going on basically on the other side of the galaxy? Well, that's, that's actually changes with Lisa. We will be able to see uh, binary stars um, on the other side of the, basically throughout the entire Milky Way, and that's something I think is is, is pretty cool. That well, yeah, but Thomas, them. you're not really seeing them, are you? You're just kind of <laughs> you'll see their collisions. I mean, when you say you see something in electromagnetic waves, we know what we mean. We could see it in whatever wavelength it is. But if you, to see something in gravitational waves, you have to see it as a disturbance. That's the only way to really see it, right? Exactly. And it's actually not the collisions what we're seeing. We see them actually about a few 10,000, 100,000 years, maybe a million years before they collide. Really? So they, I did so not they're, know that. They're, they're something like separated, pretty much like the Earth and Moon, something like this, but then not masses like Earth and Moon, but more like masses like the Sun, but separated uh, Earth, -like moon, Earth and Moon. And they are orbiting ah. around each other on the other side of the galaxy. And we indeed C is probably the wrong word for that. We actually catch their gravitational wave signal and then You're surfing learn, the waves. Learn exactly and learn from that. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So but so when something is orbiting, you know, you got this exactly. these two bodies going around. That you can see. Uh, exactly. But you're not gonna see just as long as they're close signal. enough together. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Exactly. right. So there, imagine, need to be, there needs to be some action going on so, so, in space. So imagine, imagine you have an object which is the size like the Earth, but has the mass of the Sun. And then you have another object which is also the size like the Earth, but has the mass of the Sun. And then you put them where the Moon is now. So something you can really imagine, something like this. And then they orbit around each other every couple of minutes. So, so, Mar so, so Martin, you were saying earlier that the, the mass of the gravity, the, the mass of the collision affects its frequency. So really big, massive things have a really low frequency. But what about the amplitude? Couldn't, couldn't the, wouldn't a really tiny, I'm, I'm saying tiny because compared to a black hole, something like a white dwarf uh, or neutron stars, those are tiny. Um, wouldn't they have a small amplitude compared to a supermassive black hole? And wouldn't something like that's a ground base? True, but if you're looking at it on just the other side of our galaxy, in cosmic terms, that's just our backyard. And the signal will be stronger that we observe because it's so close in relative terms. Those supermassive black holes could be, you know, billions of light years away. They will be typically billions of light years away. But what Thomas is talking about is way closer than that. Okay. Right, right. So we're seeing things within our own galaxy that happen to be yeah. obscured by the galaxy or dust and, and yeah. things that electromagnetic radiation can't get through. Um, so that how do you think that'll affect um, the census of the galaxy? How many, I mean, we have a pretty good idea about what the galaxy is, is made of, how, white dwarfs, stars, how much dark matter there is, all of that stuff. Do you think these observations in gravitational waves will make much difference to our oh. census of what we know is out there? Absolutely, for sure. Well, oh, really? Oh, oh absolutely. 100% sure. Because we are actually, honestly, we are pretty limited from the electromagnetic wave. So imagine that um, theory predicts there should be thousands of them, of these, of these double white dwarfs across the galaxy. Well, we know a dozen at this point, or maybe 20. So we will increase the number of these systems by several orders of magnitude and, and can learn much more about the population. So absolutely, there's no doubt. Okay. 
All right. So in, in so Kiara uh, was I, talking. Oh, go ahead, Kara. Kiara. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to point out something that might seem funny. Uh, the fact actually that we have this great potential in gravitational waves, so the fact that okay, they are messengers from very far away is due to the fact that they interact very little. And this is also the reason why it took so long for us to detect them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. because they also interact very feebly with our detectors. So this is why they, they require these huge devices to be to be catched. So it is at the same time an, a huge advantage, but also a disadvantage. Okay. I just want to remind everybody that I am looking at your chats, and I promise I'll get to your questions. I see them there. I just want to get uh, a little bit more uh, of my questions answered because I'm running this. <laughs> and, and then I'll get to you guys. Uh, but uh, uh, Charles, just real quick. Um, uh, you're interested in the 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 link. Uh, sounds like in a lot of what uh, Kiara is also working on. Um, so, in addition to phase transitions of the universe, um, what else can gravitational waves teach us with respect to cosmology and the large scale structure of the universe? Well, that's uh, an excellent question. Um, and many... speak loudly if you can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will try. Uh, there are many things that can be learned. So one thing that um, I was very interested in is to measure the expansion rates of the universe. Um, and this can be achieved with very different ways, uh, with, uh, with light, for example, supernova uh, allow you to do that. So anytime you want to do this, you need a measurement of distance and of velocity. And, um, and so there are many systems which allow you to do that, including supernova, mega masers, stuff. But uh, gravitational waves also have the potential to do this, uh, and there have been, uh, they have been called standard sirens, an analogy to standard candles. Yes. The candles, we can see them. Standard sirens, we can kind of hear them. Um, and so uh, this is a very interesting topic because there, there has been a lot of uh, this discrepancy between the, measure, the measurement of the expansion rate of the universe from local measurements with um, supernova and, and stuff like this and from the early universe uh, with uh, the CMB, the cosmic microwave black box. And if you measure the expansion rate the, with the early universe, you have to assume a cosmological model, uh, which is uh, the accepted one is called lambda CDN. You assume general relativity holes, you have dark energy, you have this uh, dark matter that you have, you don't know what it is. and the two values just don't match. So you have H0, it's called H0, it's the expansion rate. Uh, they just don't match. You have one from the early universe and you have one from the late universe. And uh, they're just, they disagree. And the error bars are shrinking as time passes by. So uh, I'm, I'm really curious to see what we're going we're gonna to find with, uh, with gravitational waves in the future. So we're going to measure this H0 uh, with gravitational waves uh, with LISA, with LIGO. We, we, we were able to do so with um, one neutron star uh, event that we had in 2017. So this allowed us to have the distance measurement with the gravitational wave. And since it's a neutron star, we also have um, an optical uh, measurement. So we measure uh, the position extremely precisely and we can localize the host galaxy. So we also have a measurement of the speed. Uh, and, and so this allows us to measure, to make a, a measurement of this H0. And for now, it's just in between the two values of the early and late. Isn't universe. that the way? Is in that the way of it? It's inconclusive, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's inconclusive for now. The error bars are too large, uh, but the error bars are going to shrink as one over the square root of the number of events. Uh, and so, hopefully, uh, at some point, we're we're going to get the measurement. So I'm curious to see in which direction it's going to go. One over the square root of what did you say? Of the number of events. Okay, good. So we need more events. That's right. So, yeah. uh, so yeah. to, to, I love this idea of a standard siren. I'm very interested in the discrepancy uh, between H naught and the different values people are getting, and how this can help resolve that. The the uh, to to have a standard siren, do you need all three components? You need a neutron star merger, uh, a neutron. Well, it needs to be a neutron star so you can see it in uh, mm -hmm. in, in electromagnetic radiation and uh, so and localize it to a galaxy. You kind of need those three things for it to be not a necessarily. Um, okay. It's better if you do have a nailed-on electromagnetic counterpart. But the other way you can approach it is that you get a distance from your gravitational waves, 
and that will indicate perhaps a number of galaxies that could be the host of that standard siren. And then you perform your analysis by kind of averaging over them. So it sounds a bit kind of clunky, but actually with LISA, the potential to do that is way better because we can localize the position so better than we can do with LIGO and Virgo. And that means the number of galaxies you're averaging over that could have been the host to your standard siren is correspondingly a lot smaller. So that method, the so-called dark siren method, will work much better with LISA in the future than it's currently working with LIGO Virgo analyses. What if it doesn't converge? Wouldn't that suck? I mean, wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't that wouldn't that suck if you had got kind of a third answer? Then then it would be like, okay, we need to just stop. We there's there's obviously something we don't get here. There's a lot of things we're not we're not understanding. I personally have a problem with the type one A supernova guys. I think they maybe are making a little too many assumptions about these light curves that they're coming up with their standard candles. That's just me, and I don't know anything. But um, I, I think the CMB guys are probably closer only because I don't understand what the heck they're doing. And it's impressive <laughs> to me what they're doing. You know, I don't know what a baryon acoustic oscillation is, if it hit me in the face, but it is, it is pretty, uh, it is pretty interesting to uh, uh, their answer being different seems right to me. I base that on nothing. So, <laughs> all right, let me get to some questions, guys. I promise. First, let me thank Hans Milling. Thank you for your support. Also, uh, Simon Farmer. Thank you both very much. And I'm going to start with Simon Farmer who has a question. I'm just curious how much technology is in common between LIGO and space-based missions? I guess that would be Lisa. That's the only one there is. Uh, will there be a reason to do ground-based observations after we move to space? And can they work together? Who wants to take well, that? Firstly, can I just note that Lisa isn't the only game in town for space-based. There are two really? projects under development in China, which really look very promising too. that are a much earlier stage than Lisa. But it's not impossible that in the 2030s we will have multiple space-borne gravitational wave detectors. Oh, okay. So that was just to All put right, that in then. there. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing to note is that, yes, there's a lot of common technology, but there's also common science goals. And maybe, maybe you know, the others can, can talk about that. Um, but just on the, the technology side, um, the, the, the basic principles of laser interferometry just require incredible precision um, both in the placing of all the optical components. You know, my group in Glasgow, um, colleagues of mine built the optical bench for LISA Pathfinder. They're going to be involved in building the optical bench for LISA. But other members of that same group were involved in building the optical components for Advanced LIGO. So that common expertise is invaluable to have it across the board. But like I say, there's lots of common science goals as well. And, you know, again, I, I, I've talked I'll, I'll let the others pitch in with that, um, but it's certainly Jessica, not the can you case that you go maybe with. Je maybe you know, Jessica could come in on the, the common research. science goals. Exactly. Exactly. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, first, um, so yes, there is a lot of the technology that is in common. Um, so both of them are using interferometry, of course. Um, but uh, LIGO, its um, its arms are pretty much fixed, and then of course out in space. We have three spacecraft and they're all going to be moving. So the distances between them are never really going to be fixed. So that comes with a whole host of um, issues that we'll have to deal with. And also, you probably mentioned this in the beginning. I couldn't hear um, part of the beginning, but um, in space, we have to um, adjust the test mass so that it remains inertial the whole time. And that was part of the um, Pathfinder mission. Um, so those are just some examples, but yeah. What, is, yeah, what like, does that mean to be inertial? Um, so you want to keep the test mass in an inertial reference frame so that you can, so that you're actually measuring um, gravity's effect. Um, Cause if the test mass is moving along with the spacecraft then you know, it's just, it's moving along. And so um, it can't measure the, the path link changes in the distances due to gravity alone. How far apart will they will they be uh, roughly? Um, the, three, about the three notes. Million kilometers, about two and a half million, and a half million kilometers. Wow, wow, that's yeah. how far away L one is or L two is from here, from, from the Earth Sun L two point. So uh, that's that's pretty far. So um, and and but but that might change, right? Can you does it? Can you move them closer uh, together and further apart? And is there an advantage to doing that? 
not sure about that. Um, I'd say once once they're up and in orbit, they'll remain, you know, um, with pretty much the same distance. Um, but the the distance will fluctuate um, due to the rotation of the spacecraft and its orbit. Um, and then it's also just going to get slightly closer together and slightly further apart outside of the effect due to gravitational waves. Um, but no, you won't really have like a, a huge, huge distance changes um, in the middle okay. of the mission. Okay. Um, and uh, so I'm going to get to uh, Gregorius is asking, he, it's, obs it's ob obscured by the bloody galaxy core. How can we detect something happening behind the galactic core? Uh, sorry, maybe I, I would like to say something about, uh, if I may, uh, about the, the the previous question. That oh, you may. The, thank you. So the the um, uh, because uh, actually the the science objectives of uh, uh, space based and ground based missions are fully complementary. So certainly there is uh, still uh, you know many reasons to go on with observation from uh, from ground once Lisa will be in space. And in particular, just just to just to make an example, um, so the frequency at which uh, a binary uh, is emitting depends on the, the distance of the two uh, black holes, let's say, or the two compact objects that are orbiting around each other. Therefore, this means that so if if the two objects are are more separated, they emit at, at a lower frequency. Therefore, it means that there are some sources, some binaries that Lisa can pick up in an early stage of their life while they are still quite separated to emit in the milliards. And then as the two objects lose gravitation, lose energy through gravitational wave emission, they get closer and closer until when they merge. And these objects that they will be picked up by ground-based detectors that operate at higher frequency exactly when they will be about to merge. So we might actually follow the same binary system along his path, the path of its life, which is extremely interesting scientifically. So and it is really one of the big case yeah, for, for having the two, the two missions at the same time. And they're and looking can, at, go ahead. And you, sorry, and you can even go that far and say that for example, the very first LIGO detection is really massive, a few tens times uh, the mass of the Sun black hole mergers. Uh, that would have probably been detected by Lisa a few years before the merger. So basically, Lisa would see it, and then you almost can time your clocks and say, well, in a couple of years, you better make sure LIGO is running. And, and you even more, you can say, now let's point all the telescopes exactly at that time on the sky to see if we, if we detect an electromagnetic kind is, of light. It, is that right? Like that's yep. amazing. So yeah, it could go. You know, guys, we got a collision coming up here in a couple of uh, what hundred years. Uh, you might you you might want to. Can, can you get that kind of uh, detail from it? Can you say when yep. and where it's going to happen? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you can say now, when to the second precision. Yeah. You can say in ten years' second. time. Wow. Yeah, at the second precision, there is going to be a merger in the LIGO band. Because we have seen it ten years before in the Lisa band. That's so cool. So it's quite so, exciting. Yeah, no kidding. I can see why everybody wants to get this up there. So the the now LIGO has always been challenged because, but well, now that it has three observatories, not so much. But in 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 its directionality, finding out where things happen in the sky has been. We've seen these really huge error bars, right? Um, will will what kind of directionality will Lisa have? You know, into finding where things are in the sky. Will it be better than uh, LIGO? That depends uh, very much on the on the source. So for uh, for uh, very massive uh, black hole binaries uh, with a high signal to noise ratio and uh, you know in particular positions of the sky, there there is going the, the localization will be done much better than LIGO. Sometimes, you know, even better than five degrees squared. But these are particular sources. So on average, the sky localization is not uh, uh, is not great, and it is certainly not uh, comparable to what you can do with electromagnetic observation. So by definition, localization with gravitational waves is always uh, worst. Okay, all right. But we can also take this or turn this around and say, for example, we know some systems already on the sky 
which Lisa will see in the future. So we know the sky position already really, really, really well. And then that might help um, because we can basically say, Lisa, you better look there and you should see something. Because, because yeah. from ground-based, we know there is a, is a gravitational wave source. Okay. Um, so Virtual Assistant on Twitch has got a question for Jessica. Um, it's it's uh, TDI, uh, which is time delay interferometry, delays the fourth dimension? That's his question. I don't understand what he means. You, it, the, what do you mean by this? Why, why don't we talk a little bit more about TDI and what it really is? Because I don't get it either. Well, I guess so. If delay is in the units of time, it would be the fourth dimension. So yes, if we're working in the in in time. Yeah. Um, so yes, the delays in TDI are the delays that you need to apply to your signals. So you apply a, a certain a certain amount of a delay to the signal, and then you apply another amount to the signal, and you add these together. So that in the end, you end up simulating an equal arm interferometer. Um, so that's that's basically what the delays are. And yeah, so you need to know um, the delays are also the, the actual distance. So if you convert the distance to time, um, that is going to be exactly what you need to, to simulate an equal arm interferometer. You need to have the, the exact distance. Okay. Um, on, all right. Let me get to I got so many questions. Dr. Uh, Christian Sassy on um, Periscope is asking, how do the shape of gravitational waves differ from acoustic or electromagnetic waves? That's a good question. How do they, how are they different? Charles, do you want to take that Mark, one? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I can, I can try. Um, so, so ah, it's not so easy. Uh, so, so for both gravitational waves and, and electromagnetic waves, you have this, they're both waves. So you have a frequency dependent in the amplitude. You can picture it as a wave. Probably the one difference that I would say is the most important that gravitational waves are uh, well described by a, what is called a spin two uh, field. Um, and, and electromagnetic waves are described by a spin one field. Uh, and what this means is, uh, is the properties on the rot rotations of the waves. So for electromagnetic waves, uh, you will find the same effect on matter by doing a, ro a rotation of 360 degrees. Uh, and for uh, gravitational waves, you should do a rotation of 180 degrees. So you can think of a gravitational wave as a, as a rugby ball. So you, you see a rugby ball. Then you make a rotation by 180 degrees, and you find the same effect on the on the movement of particles. Uh, and this, I would say, is the is the biggest difference uh, between an electromagnetic and gravitational wave. Okay, hang on. So I'm I'm you just blew my mind. So with an electromagnetic wave, the effect on a on matter is the same if you rotate it three one. In, in yeah, 360 so, degrees. So if you think of a, an electromagnetic wave going in in this direction, then the effect right. that it will it would have would be something like this, it goes up and down. Right? Oh, I see what you mean. And um, I'll just clean it to go like this. Um, so if you go up, it's it's the same if you do this rotation by 360 degrees. But the, oh. the wave is different because if you take a circle of particles, it moves. It, it sh shrinks in one direction and it extends in the other direction. And to have this symmetry thing, you have to do a rotation by only uh, half a circle. So okay. So when the minute you did this, and I started visualizing polarization. Yeah. I was like, okay, I get what you're talking about now. Yeah. And then, uh, but uh, you know, so so that effect is a is a 360 degree when the gravitational wave would just be a 180 degree because it's more of a a, a compressive wave, isn't it, than a gravitational wave is, than a transverse wave, like an E&M wave or something like that. I don't know. I'm just saying words now. Okay. Well, uh, well, that's a good question, Greg, uh, uh, Christian. Thank you for asking that. Um, and uh, um, Gregorius is, is asking, so the heavier the star, the bassier the chirp. We should talk about a chirp. What is that? That's something that seems to be specific to 
uh, gravitational wave events, right? Who wants to talk about what chirps are and what he means by the base or the chirp? Or is he even right? Martin, you can go with that one. Uh, yeah. Sure, I, I don't want to hear, but I'm absolutely. I'm You're the before the more massive the star, then the lower the frequency, where it merge with an equal mass companion, um, and as approach each other, then that frequency is so. Uh, I think um, Thomas was saying that. Oh no, it was uh, Chiara that they would have even lower frequency. When they're further apart, approach each other, the frequency increases and increases and increases, and that rising frequency is a pattern that it sounds a little bit like. So, so that characteristic of the rising frequency is the chirp, and the more massive the stars are, then the lower the frequency at which the rise kind of maxes out. So, hence the base of the chirp. Okay, thank you. Uh, Simon Farmer, again, are there people working on what sort of gravitational frequencies might be associated with different epochs in the universe? I think, uh, you know, I think we, uh, uh, Kiara already brought into some of this already. Um, uh, can gravitational yeah. waves inform us about early galaxy formation? Kiara and, uh, <laughs> and, and Charles also, I think you can comment on that too, right? So. Yes, I can answer the, fir the first part of the of the question. Okay. Uh, yes, so indeed, in the very early universe, now I'm talking about the epochs before the generation of the uh, cosmic microwave background. Uh, so when the universe is opaque to, to photons. Um, in that case, uh, the gravitational wave sources um, are uh, uh, characterized uh, by a frequency which corresponds to uh, what we call the Hubble scale uh, at, that, at that particular moment in the, in the early universe. And the Hubble scale is basically the causal horizon. So it is the length, the furthest length, at which um, whatever signal, uh, be it uh, gra in gravitational wave or in electromagnetic wave, um, can, be, can have propagated. And uh, uh, you know that uh, electromagnetic wave and gravitational waves in the context of uh, general relativity, they both uh, move at the speed of light, which is the maximum speed possible. And therefore, it means that uh, that particular distance, which is the furthest at which this kind of signal can travel, is also the furthest distance at which you can propagate information. So this is why we call it the causal horizon. So everything which is at shorter distance than this horizon is, can be causally connected. Everything which is outside cannot be causally connected. So if we have a source of gravitational waves, we know that it, has been, it must be causally connected. Uh, and therefore, uh, it means that uh, the frequency, the characteristic frequency of the gravitational waves that we observe now is connected to, to uh, this particular distance. And uh, this is why, this is how you actually uh, understand if you see a, a gravitational wave signal or stochastic background today, you understand where it, I mean, uh, at which epoch in the universe can be, it can be generated because you observe that characteristic frequency and you say, okay, this corresponds to that epoch at which the causal horizon was of this length. Okay, can we uh, make a quick comment about early galaxy formation? And then um, I want to get to one more question. I'm out of time because uh, we're out of time. So I want to hurry. Uh, can someone comment about early galaxy formation? What, what we might learn from gravitational waves? Anyone? No? Okay. Then um, I'm going to get to uh, one more question for Jessica, uh, and that would be, um, uh, can you talk more about the physics behind the laser noise removal? Sure. Yes. So, um, so um, first... Okay, I'll take that one real quick. The laser so noise itself, um, it's fluctuations of the frequency of the laser itself. So the laser um, has like a, a, a normal frequency that it has, but there are fluctuations to it. Um, and so you have six different lasers. You have two on each spacecraft. Um, but the noise itself ends up looking similar enough so that 
if you had um, completely equal arms, when they come back and recombine, the laser frequency noise would cancel out so we wouldn't have to worry about it. But the arms or the distances between the spacecraft will be different. And those slight differences um, make it so that we can't cancel the noise. So the, um, the process of canceling it, TDI, is what I um, alluded to a little bit um, before, which is the, um, where you, you take the data and it has this laser frequency noise in it. Um, and so data that's coming from another spacecraft, for instance, is delayed by the time that it took to get there. And um, so you have all these delays that are coming in and at one spacecraft, you would delay your data that isn't already delayed by the amount that's needed to simulate an equal arm interferometer, if that makes sense. So you okay. artificially delay and combine and then all the laser noise terms are canceled out. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I have got to stop this hangout. Um, you, there's still a lot of questions I didn't get to. Um, this, there's just a lot to cover, but I want to thank everybody. Martin, Jessica, Thomas, Charles, Chiara, thank you all so much for taking time out to teach us a little bit about Lisa. It is my sincere hope that if I reach out again, maybe we'll do a follow-up and, uh, and maybe we could learn a little bit more about um, because I want to talk about the mission launch and how things are going just real quick. Is, is everything okay? Are we, are we looking still pretty good for the mid 2030? Everything's on course. Okay, Everything good. Course. Uh, and, uh, Ariane, I suppose this will be an Ariane rocket. Will it be three launches yeah, or I, one? Uh, Ariane six and all Ariane. three spacecraft will be launched from one Ariane launcher and then they'll separate once they're outside the Earth's orbit or the Earth's atmosphere. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I, I wish you all the best of luck. Good luck on, on getting prepared for the launch. Keep us posted. Follow these guys. Their YouTube channel is in the link in the description box. They'll, so subscribe to them. I also put their uh, Twitter handle out there. So follow the LIGO uh, collaboration, um, the LIGO community, actually, on Twitter. And uh, there's also a uh, uh, there's also a free beer. Uh, what? Who wants to talk about the beer thing going on that you guys have? Charles? Uh, yeah, Cosmic Beer. Cosmic uh, beer, thank you. Yeah, yes, <laughs> give a quick shout out to Cosmic beer. Yes, uh, should I explain what Cosmic beer is? Yeah, real quick. If you got time, yeah, I don't want to take it. A... It's an event in Geneva. If you live in Geneva, if you happen to live in Geneva, we organize these Cosmic beers where we try to talk about science in a pub around a beer, uh, and then there's a quiz, and it's really fun. And I encourage you to come. <laughs> uh, yes, if you're in Geneva. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you guys again. Um, on behalf of everybody involved, all the guys with LIGO or Lisa, uh, thank you for thank you for uh, watching. I want to thank all of you for tuning in and watching the Hangout. I will be streaming again live for a Space Junk Hangout tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be talking about Christmas gifts for amateur astronomers. So by all means, watch us tomorrow on this channel and all the other places where I stream. Dustin will be with me tomorrow, 7 o'clock Eastern Time. All right. Uh, so... Uh, Again, thank you all so much for watching. Right. And as Take always, care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <you. laughs> and as always, keep looking up. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.